1970. In a strange land that saw the first Earth Day, the king meeting a president, astronauts in a challenging situation, the horrors of the Vietnam War, and the arrival of jets. We will survey the rock music landscape as we go month to month in 1970. Are you ready to go back in time? Simon and Garfunkel decide to give it one last go with their album, Bridge Over Troubled Water. This album was a bear to make with the infighting, but they pulled through and completed the album. As for the title track, Paul Simon said, Art felt like I should have done it, and many times on a stage, when I'd be sitting there off to the side, and Larry Necto would be playing piano, and Artie would be singing bridge, people would stomp and cheer when it's over. And I would think, that's my song, man. Other songs off of this album would include Cecilia, El Condor Pasa, If I Could. The album would go on to sell over 25 million copies. But far from their stellar brotherly beginnings, this would ultimately prove to be one heck of a swan song, with the title track becoming one of their biggest hits of all time. The Guess Who release American Woman. Standing like a beacon of light in a darker world, Burton Cummings would take over the airwaves singing about a mysterious woman who he cannot get out of his mind. They went more hard rock with this release, and the result would be their first album that would crack the American Top 10 charts. But with all things growth and good, they also had a setback. Randy Bachman, who also played guitar in the group, had a strained relationship with the band due to his recent conversion to Mormonism. That didn't really jive with the band's rock and roll lifestyle. But Randy would go on to form Bachman Turner Overdrive, so all was not lost. The other song that was off this album was No Sugar Tonight, which was also a huge hit. In a world that was full of deep philosophical minds and counterculture speaking out against the Vietnam War, Black Sabbath comes along like a distant, creepy cousin, with songs about the occult, Satanism, and the like. They have a different view of the impending decade, a darker one. From the grindy riffs of Nativity in Black and the title track, Black Sabbath, you can see these guys were different, and the impact they would make on the music scene for decades to come cannot be understated. Ozzy Osbourne, who got his start here, was the leader of the group. Ozzy would go on to fame and fortune with Sabbath, but when a certain Leslie West from the band Mountain introduced him to cocaine in 1971, yikes. But more on that at a different time. Mountain releases Climbing, and the song that was essentially the 70s with Mississippi Queen. The song is about an all-knowing and a little bit trashy lady. Notice the theme here? Leslie West, for my money, is the greatest guitar player you have never heard of. And if you have heard of this mountain of a guitar player, you will no doubt know that in one song, he gave hard rock a much needed jolt of fuzzy distortion that would go on to influence countless numbers of bands. The drums, the keys, everything in this song oozes sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Back in the days where looks weren't as important as they are now, Leslie reigned supreme. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young released their second album, Deja Vu. Fresh off their amazing set at Woodstock, CSNY were on sort of a spiritual journey with a ton of songs for their second album. 
although 80% of the songs would be cut from the record. David Crosby had just lost his girlfriend, Christine Hinton, to a horrible car crash, and he would break down and sob while the sessions were going on. Crosby said in 1974 that, I was not at my best as a functioning person, completely unable to deal with it all. Graham Nash actually chimed in and agreed that the mood was different from the first album, which was recorded while all of the band members were in relationships. And by the second, Joni, Mitchell, and I had split up, Stephen and Judy had split up, and Christine had just been killed. It was all dark. Still, through all that turmoil, they managed to create one of the band's lasting classic tracks with Teacher Children and the song Woodstock. Young made his own small contributions to this album, but because of a majority of it was recorded at Stephen Stills' home studio, his input was limited. Still, a great album by any standard. Paul McCartney quits the Beatles. In a move that shocked millions, Paul McCartney said he wouldn't be making music with the Fab Four ever again. And he doubled down on that thought by saying that he would never make music with John Lennon again. But according to Paul, he never meant any of that. I never intended it to mean that I'd quit. It was a misunderstanding. We got some people at the office to ask some questions, just on paper, you know, and they sent them over to our house and I just filled them out like an essay, like a school thing. When I saw the headlines, I thought, Christ, what have I done? Now we're in for it. I didn't leave the Beatles. The Beatles have left the Beatles. But no one wants to say the party is over. He continued, after all we had been through, I thought they knew me. I think we were all pretty weird at the time. I'd ring John and he'd say, don't bother me. I rang George and he came out with some effing and blinding, not at all Hare Krishna. We weren't normal to each other at the time. Still, the worst was to come for the Fab Four. The Beatles are no more. Between John and Yoko, Paul's pop-only sensibility, George's love of Indian mysticism, and Ringo just being kind of meh. The Beatles call it quits after approximately a decade of domination in pop culture. At the same time, they released the album Let It Be. This is a very strange album to be sure, with constant members quitting, accusations flying like crazy, and of course the press there to expose all of it. It was a difficult album to make. Probably the standout track from this album is the title track, Let It Be, which is prophetic to a point, because I think Paul was subconsciously saying they enjoyed their time, but now they're all going to ride off into the sunset and we have to accept that. There was mourning all over the entire world that the Beatles broke up, but this won't be the last time they would individually release music over the years. The Stooges release Funhouse. Back in 1970, five years before the Sex Pistols and seven years before the Ramones were rocking CBGBs, you had the Stooges. With all of that visceral, not care about anything attitude, frontman Iggy Pop, usually shirtless, would wail and thrash himself around with little regard for his own safety. From Detroit, the most punk rock band that existed at the time. Now, this album might not make a lot of people's lists for the best album of the 70s, but for me and my crew, this album and everything they did was monumental for everything that came after. With Joey Ramone, Jack White, Nick Cave, Buzz Osborne, Henry Rollins, and Steve Albini, rest in peace, all citing the record as one of their favorites, it's very easy to see how punk rock was forming in the harrowing streets of Detroit.
the Isle of Wight Festival 1970. So take 600,000 people, put them on an island, have the Who, The Doors, Jimi Hendrix, Chicago, Joni Mitchell, and Joan Baez, and Free playing it, and you have the Isle of Wight Festival 1970. Beating the total people at Woodstock, this was essentially the same festival, but amped up by a degree of 100. So much so that many classic live albums came out of this, such as The Who, Live at the Isle of Wight, and Free, Live at the Isle of Wight. What's absolutely crazy is that this show was basically free, with the venue having to be approved by a council, and then this council agreed the only place that they could have this show was East Afton Farm in Afton Down. One unintended result of this choice of location was that since it was overlooked by such a large hill, a significant number of people were able to watch the proceedings for free. This would also be one of Jimi Hendrix's last performances because September was around the corner. Jimi Hendrix dies. The heart and the soul of the 60s, Jimi Hendrix would join the soon to be too real 27 Club. There are countless rumors to his demise, but the most commonly accepted detail of his death was that he died from choking on his own vomit due to being intoxicated with barbiturates. When you look back over Hendrix's career, he was beloved in nearly every circle he came into contact with. He was an overly shy, soft-spoken, yet intelligent young man. He also hated being lumped in with the conventions of being a rock star. He hated the limelight and much like someone we will be discussing in a future video, Kurt Cobain, had a complicated relationship with the fame and money that came with the territory. Stephen Stills would go on to say, he was a darling, just as sweet as you could be. He was kind of intimidated by it all, but at the same time, not. To say he was wispy is to describe the way he stood and the way he danced. He was really liquid, but he was a will-o'-the-wisp, the forces around him. He would take anything that anyone gave him, which at that time in England, there were combinations that were really dangerous. That was what really got him. Rest in peace, Jimmy. And now on to another tragic death. Janis Joplin dies. Janis Joplin, she stood out in music history because she was a trailblazer. She was moving through some uncharted territory in her lifetime. And being a trailblazer, walking a path that hadn't been walked by yet by anyone else, it has its price. It can be a lonely affair. Think of trudging through whiteout conditions and snow drifts up to your knees. She was a female in a culture that was male-dominated and in a music business that was male-dominated. And she sang like a person who's lived some hard times and lived through some pain and heartache namely stemming from feeling alienated, mocked, humiliated, etc. by her homely looks and her and unconventionality during her youth in Port Arthur, Texas. Her pain was sort of the basis of the raw soul and the emotionality of her singing style. Without it, Janice wouldn't be Janice. The only way she could escape from her pain and loneliness was music, especially blues and folk music. She listened to black artists and recordings. She was heavily influenced by Bessie Smith, who was a very famous blues singer, and she fashioned her voice around Bessie Smith's stylings and found a unique voice that was all her own. 
Janice, she was her own woman. And on top of that, she had relationships with men and women as well. Trailblazer? Yeah. She lit that trail with a fire of a nuclear bomb. Rest in peace, Janice. Derek and the Dominoes put out Layla and other assorted love songs. As far as the second single and the title track off of this album, Layla, it goes like this. So there was this girl. Eric Clapton really liked her. The problem was, is this girl was Patty Boyd, and she was married to George Harrison of the aforementioned Beatles. He wrote this song for her, and the rest is history. Except not. This album was a commercial as well as a critical flop when it came out, if you can believe that. It had two singles, Layla and Bell Bottom Blues, and both of those songs are about Patty Boyd. Featuring Slide Guitar by Dwayne Allman, this album has turned into an absolute classic that will make even the hardest hearts soften. And there you have it, the year in rock of 1970. From my perspective, what did I miss? Leave it below in the comments. As always, thank you for watching, folks, and rock on.